Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to talk about how to design a linear PID controller to ensure that it meets specified requirements. We'll see this technique is based on understanding the root locus of the closed loop system and then manipulating it intelligently by modifying the controller. This is a mathematically defensible approach that allows us to make guarantees about the system performance. Now, what's so exciting about today's topic is that in fact, this technique is applicable to any type of linear controller, not just PID controllers. So while we'll use PID controllers as a case study, keep in the back of your head that this approach is generalizable to all linear controllers. Let's just pause a moment and let that sink in. This technique is applicable to all linear controllers. Now, that being said, today's discussion is gonna build on a lot of prior material. So at minimum, Please make sure you've watched at least these five videos before continuing on. Links to all these videos are in the description below. So to reiterate, as long as you're dealing with a linear system, the techniques that we're going to cover today will allow you to intelligently and effectively design a linear controller. So in the discussion today, we will apply this technique to PID controllers because as we've discussed before, PID control is probably the most popular control scheme in the world. Once you know how to design one, the world is your oyster. It's going to make you so happy that you might just want to do a little dance. Just be careful that when you're dancing, you don't pull a muscle. <laughs> Get it? Uh, all right. Anyway. Um, so if you're as excited as me uh, about this topic, then make like a seatbelt and buckle up. All right. So let's get into the discussion of how to design or designing a PID controller uh, using the root locus technique. So this is how we're going to go about designing our PID controller. So just to reiterate, let's just draw ourselves the block diagram that we've seen several times before where you've got your plant G of S and it is trying to track a specific reference signal. It's called R of T. The difference between R of T and the output gives you the error. And now the idea is this error signal is going to be broken up into a proportional component, an integral component, and a derivative component. Okay, so let's just start with this as our general architecture, right? And this diagram here, this portion was our controller, and in this case, it's a PID controller. Okay, so what we did in one of our previous videos uh, where we were discussing how to use actually the control system designer, right? That was one of our prerequisite videos that I talked about is we just focused on using uh, the root locus technique to design a proportional control, KP. So let's, how about walk before we run? And for now, let's get rid of this derivative section and maybe let's just consider designing a PI controller. So maybe let's take off this D adjective because we're not going to have a derivative component. All I want to do here is design a PI controller using this root locus technique. Okay, so let's go ahead and state the goal of this specific subsection here is to design a PI controller. Okay, so what that basically means is you need to go ahead and choose these two degrees of freedom, right? I need to choose KP and KI. Those are the only two numbers you get to, to pick, right? That's your job as control systems engineer is to choose KP and KI to get reasonable performance. So to go about this using the root locus technique, let's examine the controller a little bit more. In fact, let's figure out and write down the control law of what is U of T given E of T. Right? What's the control signal given the error at the current time? So that's pretty easy. The control law is very simple in this case. So the control law for a PI controller. Well, the control at any given time, it's just the proportional component, right? Which was KP times E of T. 
And now we're going to add on our integral component, ki times integral from 0 to t of e of tau d tau, right? Okay, let's take the Laplace transform of this. So I could write this as u of s is equal to kp e of s plus ki times 1 over s, right? Okay, so let's, uh, let's simplify this side. I could also write this as kp plus ki. Oh, sorry, whoops, I, I dropped the e of s over here. Whoops. Uh, ki over s, right? This whole thing times e of s, right? Okay, so let's move this to the other side, and we see that the transfer function between u of s to e of s, right, is kp plus ki over s, right? Or what you could do is let's, uh, let's simplify this, right? You could also write this as kps plus ki all over s, right? If you get yourself a common denominator, right? Or the other way you could write this is, let's, let's, let's factor this one more way. Let's pull the kp out in the front. So you could write this as kp times s plus ki over kp, right? All over s, right? So this is effectively our transfer function. Maybe let's write this one more time. So the controller C of S, right, which is just the transfer function of U of S over E of S is just this format. You could write it like this, KP plus S plus KI over KP all over S. All right, so let's box this up because this tells quite a lot about uh, the PI controller. If you look at this format, this is in a traditional, you know, if we think about this in a MATLAB format, it's in ZPK or zero pole K format. If you look at this thing long enough, this is basically what? It's a first order numerator. So there's one real zero and the zero is located at negative KI over KP. And there is a pole at the origin. Right? So what's really fascinating about a PI controller is the other way you can think about it is a PI controller is nothing more than one real zero, right, at minus ki over kp, right? And then it's one pole at the origin, right? So from a pole zero map perspective, a pi controller, let me just sketch it over here where we've got a little bit of room, is you just have a real uh, a pole at the origin right here, and then you have a zero located at minus ki over kp, okay? So the other way you could think about this is earlier we said the goal here was to choose kp and ki, right? You had these two degrees of freedom. You can choose either one of these two. The other way to think about this is you can, you're free to move the location of this zero, right? because it, you get to play with these two. And you can also change the constant gain here. So the other way you could think of designing a PID controller, one way is obviously is to choose KP and KI, or the alternative way is you can say, move the, Z, the real zero and also change over all gain of the controller, right? So the degrees of freedom, maybe let's just, circle those in green here, right? You can change this value and you can change this value, right? Which basically gives you also another two degrees of freedom, but I think these two degrees of freedom are a little bit more intuitive if we're thinking about root locus, because you can clearly see where are the roots, uh, or, or sorry, where are the poles and zeros that you're introducing via this controller. So, what we should do here is um, let's go ahead and give me a second to uh, erase the board and let's look at the same example we were doing earlier with our position control the DC motor with this framework in mind of how to design a PI controller for that plant. All right, so let's look at our example of controlling our DC motor, uh, the position of the DC motor. So in this case, the plant here, I think we call this uh, GP or for the positioning of the plants. Maybe we should call this GP here. Okay, so we said the position giving 
the angle of the wheel over the uh, armature voltage to the system here, or the control signal, was given by, just to refresh your memory, again, we did talk about this in our previous video, one of those prerequisite videos, so I'm not going to cover this in detail, I'm just going to flash it back up for convenience. Uh, 1021S squared plus 4845S. Okay, great. This was our example system, that was our plant here, and we said that some of the requirements in that previous video were things like uh, the percent overshoot had to be less than 40%, uh, we needed the uh, rise time to be less than one second, we needed the uh, settling time to be less than three seconds, we needed uh, a gain margin greater than 20 decibels and a phase margin of greater than 30 degrees. And finally, we wanted a bandwidth of greater than five radians per second. Okay, and again, in our last video, we showed that, all right, one way to get that performance here was just use proportional only. And I think we showed that if you just use KP is equal to 0.55, that was a system that actually satisfied all of those requirements. So now you might be asking, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why even bother adding this integrator, right? Uh, why don't we jump over to MATLAB and maybe jump over to the lab actually to see, A, does this work? And uh, is it actually broke? And do we need to fix it? All right, so I've just started a very quick, uh, simple MATLAB script to get our transfer function set up and define our simple proportional gain. So let's just run this. And I also have a Simulink model pre-built, which shows how this system should respond, at least theoretically in simulation. So let's just run this with this proportional gain of KP of 55 and see what we get. And here's the scope, and look at that. Again, like we saw earlier, we designed this gain KP to be exactly uh, right in the sense that it satisfies all the performance requirements. So look at this. The yellow line is obviously our commanded reference, and the blue line is the actual position of the motor. And this looks beautiful, right? You, ha you meet the settling time and the rise time and all the other requirements with the system. But... What happens if we tried to take this idealized proportional controller, which appears to look beautiful in simulation, and maybe bring it over to the real DC motor? Let's see what happens. When we try to implement this same proportional controller on the real DC motor with the same commanded step change magnitude of 90 degrees, we see that this controller fails completely. We see that we only get a little over 40 degrees of rotation before it gets stuck. Remember, the linear simulation claimed it would be perfect and it would go to 90 degrees with zero steady state error. The problem gets worse if there are any external disturbances. Here, I'm taping on some ball bearings to apply an approximate constant torque and we see that with each additional disturbance, the steady state error gets worse. This illustrates some of the dangers of designing a controller for a real system based on a linear model. So in this case, the linear system wasn't able to model the real friction and we didn't account for external disturbances. So the controller looked great in theory, but in practice, it was not great. All right, so that just highlights the lack of robustness of a proportional control only. I mean, I guess if you want to say it in more plain language, this is just a piece of junk, right? We need to add uh, a couple of performance requirements because clearly this didn't capture everything. So let's just cross this out. This is junk. And let's go ahead and add a couple of more requirements. So let's put a few additional recs. Okay, so let's also say that we need to have uh, zero steady state error. And also we should say that this thing is robust to external disturbances. Again, we added this one because we saw that, you know what, actually that proportional control, again, in theory got you zero steady state error, but we saw in practice that's a different story. So really the combination of these two additional requirements really does now make a case for adding the integral component to our controller. So what I wanna do now is let's go over to MATLAB and fire up the control system designer and see if we can design a PI controller using the root locus technique. So again, 
I'll stress again, right now, if you haven't watched the video on how to use the control system designer in MATLAB, please, please, please take a moment to stop and make sure you review and understand and are very comfortable with the workflow that we discussed there because that's exactly what we're gonna be doing here with our PI controller with a couple of Epsilon tweaks. So give me a second, let's pause the video and jump over to MATLAB. All right, so let's go ahead and use the control system designer to design a PI controller. So again, please make sure you've watched that video where we did discuss how to use a control system designer because I'm just gonna blaze through and quickly gloss over the steps because I'm gonna assume that you've seen this before. So step one is create a TF of the system slash plant, all right? So we're gonna say GP is transfer function of GP num and GP den. And then step two was start the app, right? So all we're gonna do is just say control system designer and pass in GP so we don't have to manually import this in the app. So I'm gonna hit run and that is going to bring up our control system designer in our other window. I will maximize it here so it's plotting. Uh, okay, so now what we're going to do for step three is we're going to add all of our design requirements and our additional plots. So one of the plots that we may want is let's get a new Bode plot, which is a transfer function R to Y, right? This is the closed loop transfer function so we can understand the system bandwidth. Let's put the two of those two on top of one another. Um, the other one that might be helpful to look at during this process is let's make a new step response. And now let's look R to U so we can see how the control signal operates in this fashion here we go r to u r to y all right this looks good i think we've got the plots we want let's start adding our design requirements so i'm going to come here to our step response of r to y and i'm going to add a new design requirement where we said we need better than one second rise time less than three seconds of settling time and no more than 40 percent overshoot so i'll hit ok here we go. Let's also, while we're at it, look at what those actual values are right now. So I'll add our settling time and also our characteristic on the rise time. There we go. Okay, so we think, uh, I guess if we can get all these to, to look nice. There we go. Um, for giggles, we can also zoom in on our root locus editor. We talked about this earlier that since our DC motor has very fast dynamics out here and very slow dynamics, we probably care about the slow dynamics. So let's, let's zoom in a little bit here. This is where all the action is going to occur. And we could also add design requirements if we wanted to. For example, again, our settling time of less than three seconds. And we could also add our design requirement of less than... 40% overshoot and again remember these are suggestions or they're not entirely accurate because we don't actually have a second order system and actually that's going to be important a little bit later so uh, just keep that in mind uh, where else do we have some design requirements oh here in our closed loop Bode uh, plot we said we could add a new design requirement that I want the system to maintain uh, we wanted above the 3 dB, the negative 3 dB line, because this was where we wanted the bandwidth to be. So again, let's maybe zoom into the area of action here where I want the bandwidth to be above five radians per second. So again, this system seemed to be doing great, but like we just saw in the real application, uh, this is not actually great, right? Everything looks great in simulation, but we really need that integral control component to ensure that it's robust to external disturbances and steady state error. So we saw that to do that, right now our compensator is very simple. It's a static gain of value K1. And what you can do here is if you right click on the root locus and you say edit compensator, you'll get this other dialog box to pop up. And let's change this back to 0.555. This is exactly what we were using earlier. And you can see when I hit enter, everything updates. And we say, okay, this looks great, but we know this doesn't work. This is broken. What we have to do is we want to make this, instead of a proportional controller, we wanted to make it a PI controller. And what we showed on the board is a PI controller is nothing more than an integrator uh, basically a pull at the origin, and a real zero. So when I come here to this dynamic section of the tool, I can just click on right click on this and say add polar zero. Look at this, let's add an integrator. And now look at this, the controller structure has changed. So now I have, basically this is just an integral controller. But if I want the PI portion of it, I also have to add that zero. So I'm gonna, again, right click on this and say add real zero, uh, re polar zero, and click on real zero. And here you go. Now I have a PI controller right now. So let me close this dialog 
And again, come to the root locus and we'll zoom in a little bit to, again, this is where the action's occurring. And what you can see is a all of these magenta lines, like we talked about, magenta items are things that you can manipulate or move. So this red X right here, or the magenta X you're seeing, that is the integrator. So actually, I don't want to move that. That has to stay at the origin. But this little zero here, this can move, right? This is the zero that is associated with the um, PI controller. And you'll notice there's some little weird rendering artifacts, I guess, in this tool, like like right here. This is, whoops, well, no, I guess it fixed itself. But some of the times, uh, here we go. This is super odd. This is an artifact of the rendering. You know a root locus has to look symmetrical about the real axis, but just the way that MATLAB decides to uh, use um, finite spacing when it's drawing the root locus, it makes it look like it's not symmetrical, but it actually is. You can see that if you grab this line, uh, one of the closed loop poles, and you start moving it around, MATLAB will eventually be, you know, it, see, look here, it starts to connect the dots a little bit better, and you do see that it is symmetrical. Maybe it's better if I grab this other one up here. Anyways, small anecdote here that this is just a rendering artifact. You you can see here that clearly the root locus is symmetrical. So the game now with designing the PI controller is instead of trying to blindly change P, uh, KP and KI values, I'm going to manipulate the poles and the zeros and uh, the components of the controller to get the performance I want directly in the root locus. So you can see as I move this around, this is why the control system designer is so great. We can see all of our performance metrics updating in real time. So you can see here that the percent overshoot and uh, the settling time and all these requirements are, are displayed. So you can see right now, we are not meeting the settling time requirement. We got five seconds of settling time. So we need to play around with this until we get this to uh, match. So what I'm gonna do is, you know, I'll move the zero and now I'm gonna move the closed loop pole. So and you can see in real time over here on the on the left pane, since I have the C button clicked, you can see what the compensator is or the controller that yields the root locus. So you can see I am basically increasing this and we're increasing effectively the, the, the proportional gain is kind of what we're doing here. Okay, so let's see here. What are we doing? Um, this is a... Oh, actually, this is actually maybe an interesting point to maybe... Maybe let's uh, let's take a take take a look at this. I wanted to point this out because earlier I was trying to hammer home this idea that if you look at the root locus and you look at the regions of um, uh, I guess feasibleness or the allowable regions of the root locus uh, for these design requirements. Remember this these diagonal lines. We claim these design requirements were for the forty percent or less. Uh, overshoot. Notice here that the roots here, they are well within the the forty percent value here, right? They're in the white area. But look at the step response. The step response claims you're over forty percent. So that clearly states that you know something is odd here. Uh, and the reason why is because this is not a second order system. It's not even second order dominant, right? There are three poles that are very similar in location to each other. So this is actually, well, well, technically it's a fourth order system, right? There is one pole that's way out there at minus a thousand ish or something like that. We really don't care about that. That one is is so fast that it really doesn't influence the dynamics. It's these three that are interacting here and creating more complicated dynamics. So again, you cannot trust the uh, regions of allowability in the complex plane where we have these lines here. You can trust the step response, right? This is accurate. So uh, just again, to show the paradox, right? The root locus in the complex plane claims you have better than 40% overshoot, but in reality, you've got over 40%. And in fact, you, you also see this with the settling time requirement, right? You see that the settling time, we have one pole that the settling time, it makes it look like it's worse than three seconds, right? Because this vertical line was our three second settling time line. And you got this pole that's, that's to the right of that line. So you might think if you looked up at this root locus uh, or the the areas of the complex plane, you might think, hey, this system is uh, is meeting percent overshoot, but not meeting settling time. But if you look at the step response, it's the exact opposite scenario, right? You are not meeting the percent overshoot, but you are meeting the settling time requirement. So really, we should be looking at the, the, the step response for all of those time domain uh, responses.
Okay, so with that being said, the game is continue playing around with this until you get something that you're happy with. So again, you can grab and drag the zeros, grab and drag these poles, or the other option here is you could right click and you know say edit compensator, and you can directly change these values in here. Like for example, point, I can plug, plug in point, 360205, oh, right? And right here, you can change the location of the zero. So if you didn't want this at minus 0 0.09, you can move it to like, I don't know, minus 0 0.8654. Okay. So for example, now I hit OK, and that updates the root locus. And again, you see this weird artifact show up. But let's quickly do a scan on all of our performance metrics. So yeah, check it out. We meet the settling time requirement. We meet the percent overshoot. We meet the rise time. We meet the gain margin. We meet the phase margin. Let's look at the closed loop bandwidth. Again, this is the one that's harder to read here. So here's one radians per second, two, three, four, five, so, yeah, so again, I think we meet, yeah, we meet the bandwidth requirement. And lastly, let's do a check here on the step response of the control signal. And this is great. Less than half a volt in order to get this performance over uh, this, uh, this experiment. So this looks awesome. So what we should probably do is let's go ahead and export the controller because that looks awesome. So maybe let's export this as, I will change the name to... C, how about PI? And we'll hit export. And now that should be in our MATLAB workspace. Let's come back and we can see that we've got C, PI. So this is the compensator that we claim will work. All right, so now on to step six, which was let's save our controller. So maybe let's call this um, PI controller dot mat and we'll save the thing we called CPI. Okay, so we've got that, and we could also go back to our control system designer and, uh, whoops, where was our control system designer? It was over here. And let's go ahead and save this session just in case we want to come back to this. So I'll give this the underscore PI. Okay, so now we've saved both the control system designer session and the controller. I can go ahead and close the control system designer. And maybe the next thing we want to do is... Uh, this is our PI controller, but it, I always like to think about what is the KP gain, what's the KI gain. If you remember from our discussion on the board, we saw that the KP value is basically I want to write the numerator in a polynomial format, and KP is just going to be the coefficient of S. So you can easily see that in this case, KP is going to be 0 0.41623, and then KI is going to be the constant in the numerator. So in this case, it's going to be... 0 0.46, so that number times, uh, what, 0 0.8654. So these were our two gains. So let me just go ahead and, and evaluate this selection so I can get both KP and KI in the in the, um, the workspace. So here we go. And now what we can easily do is let's go ahead and augment our PID controller, and let's just go ahead and add an integrator to this loop and whoops sorry and I will copy this and get myself another gain and this gain needs to be ki and now we've got our integral path and now let's go ahead and add a summing block and just simulate the system to verify that we get the appropriate functionality that we expect so again let's go ahead and run the simulation and hit the scope and here we go so this also looks great in simulation now remember the trick now would be to see if this controller that we designed now does any better on the real system so let's go ahead and run over to the lab with this set of kp and ki gains and give it a try Let's use the same minus 90 degree step input we did before, but now with a PI controller. And we see that the PI controller works much better on the real system. The system is still subject to these nonlinear friction forces, which temporarily cause the motor to get stuck, especially when it's near the set point. When it's near the set point, we know that the proportional control is doing very little because the error is small, and since the control is proportional to that small error, that yields a small control signal. However, as you can see here, the integral component of the control starts to wind up and accumulate this small error, and eventually it's enough to make a difference. For some reason, as I'm watching this, the phrase, death by a thousand paper cuts, pops into my head here. You know, you've got this big, bad friction that says, 
ha ha ha, I'm this difficult nonlinear phenomena that you can't account for with linear modeling, and as such, I have defeated your puny proportional control. But then your integrator comes in and slowly accumulates this error until it overcomes this nonlinear phenomena. So in the end, it's the integral component of control that is enough to overcome the friction and eventually drive the system to zero steady state error. The controller does a great job with external disturbances as well. So the system is still holding steady at the minus 90 degree location that we commanded earlier. And now let's tape on a heavy ball bearing to introduce that approximate constant disturbance torque. Now, if you recall, the proportional only controller that we looked at earlier failed miserably in this scenario as the steady state error just grew each time we added more disturbance torque. But in this case, we see that the PI controller can handle this unaccounted torque and eventually return the system to the set point. So this really shows how an integral component of the controller really adds to the robustness of the overall system. Notice that the constant control needed to maintain this minus 90 degree set point has changed from what it was originally, which is to be expected because now there's a constant torque from the ball bearing that it needs to oppose. Furthermore, note that when the system's at the desired set point, there's actually no error. So the proportional component of the controller is doing nothing. 100% of the control needed to maintain this zero steady state error comes from the integral component. So if we let this run longer, you'll eventually see that the system does achieve zero steady state error. But at this point, this is kind of like watching grass grow or I guess to be more accurate, it's watching integrator uh, accumulation state grow. So tell you what, uh, why don't you just take my word for it that it gets to zero and we'll move on to something bigger and better. All right, so that worked great. So why don't we keep on trucking and see if we can extend this concept to now a full PID control. So let's add back our derivative branch. So I'll add a KD followed by a, let's start with a pure uh, uh, deriver, uh, derivative to start. So now let's make this a pure PID controller, okay? So we play the exact same trick. Namely, we need to write down what the control law for this system is. And we've got, uh, as expected, U of T is, you know, we still have the same KP E of T plus KI times integral zero to T E of tau D tau. And now we are adding our KD times D E of T DT, right? So taking a little plus transform is again, something very simple. Uh, oops, sorry, E of S plus KI over S plus K D S. And again, collecting, uh, oh gosh, sorry. And I keep forgetting to put the E terms here. So this is our E of S plus K D S E of S. Great. So grouping and pulling out the E of S, we get KP plus KI over S plus uh, SKD. And again, getting a common denominator to make this look like a numerator polynomial or a denominator polynomial, we end up with, what do we end up with? KPS plus KI plus S squared KD, right? All over S. This is equal to U of S over E of S. Right, or I guess maybe maybe it'd be better to rewrite this in a uh, standard form where you've got the s squared term at the top here. So let's or the front s uh, so kd s squared plus k p s plus k i all over s. So this here is my c. Let's call it p i d of s. Right. So again, we see the same thing that. A PID controller, a pure PID, maybe we should maybe make a note of this. This is a pure PID, right? So all this is, is a pure PID is nothing more than a transfer function here. It's a, with two zeros, which could be potentially complex. So the components that make up a P, pure PID controller is two zeros. These have the potential to be complex, potentially complex and it has a pole at origin right a single integrator so again we see we have the same issue that the game we're going to play now is you've got yourself now a 
two zeros. They could be complex. I'll draw them as complex potentially. And you've got a pole at the origin. And again, what you get to change here is we get to move the location of these zeros. So these zeros can go, you know, you can move them here as long as they're symmetric, obviously. You can move them here. Heck, you can maybe move them all to the real axis. And then what you can do is you can also change the overall gain of the system. So same thing, we still got three degrees of freedom to, to, to play with here. You can move the, the, uh, the Y component of the zeros, the X component of the zeros, and you can choose the overall gain. So it's the same goal. A PID controller is on one hand choosing the gains KP, KI, or KD, or on the other hand, it's just choosing the location of these two zeros and the overall gain of the system. Maybe before we jump back over to Matt, uh, or actually, I don't want to jump over to MATLAB with this one because um, a couple of reasons, but just to maybe mention, take a look at this. This is actually an improper transfer function. So you can note here, right, there's more zeros than there are poles. So let's maybe make a quick side note here that this is a pure PID is improper. Right, which during our discussion of uh, practical uh, implementation issues with the PID controller, namely the video right over here, you remember we discussed how this is uh, this is kind of non-causal, right? Pure derivatives should be sending off uh, red flags and klaxons should be going off in your head as control systems engineer that a pure P uh, a pure derivative is a bad idea in your control system. So. Uh, this is a little bit odd here, right? But what I will say is that if you think about this, when you're, you're doing the root locus for this, this combination of pure P idea plus plant, right? So here was our plant over here. If you remember, what we're doing is we're doing the root locus of the combination, right, of the loop transfer function. So what I'm trying to get at is as the PID controller, this con compensator, it can be improper as long as the plant uh, transfer function is proper, right? If the plant transfer function has more poles than zeros, by the time you multiply something with more poles than zeros with something that has one more zero than a pole, you should come out with at least a uh, margin, uh, 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 a proper system, right? There should be at least the same number of zeros and poles as there are uh, for the overall system here, right? So what we're getting at here, this is my long-winded way of saying, as long as the plant has at least one more pole than zero, by the time you combine it with this pure PID controller, you can still do root locus, you can still do everything we talked about, all the rules apply, um, because the overall combination of these two things in series is something where you have at least the same number of poles and zeros. So with that being said, you could go to the control system designer and design yourself a pure PID controller by doing the same techniques we did earlier. But as we saw earlier uh, in our practical discussion, that's not a good idea. So instead of wasting some time and trying to design a pure PID controller, give me a moment to pause the and erase the board and let's talk about the actual form that is most implementable for a PID controller, namely a PI pseudo D controller. Okay, so instead of the PID controller, let's change this to a PI pseudo D. Let's maybe say PI pseudo D controller. And we remember uh, that the only difference here is we said that this was the problem here, was this pure numerical derivative. So instead, what we're gonna use is we are going to use a pseudo derivative of the form AS over S plus A. Right? This here was your pseudo derivative. Which we saw was basically again a derivative chained to a low pass filter of DC gain one. Okay, so in this case with our new architecture we can easily see what the control law is. So maybe let's go ahead and write that down again. So the control law in the Laplace domain is quite easy to see. It's just gonna be what? It's gonna be KP plus KI over s plus k d a s all over s plus a right this is your control law or the transfer function for our pseudo derivative now again let's play the exact same trick that we did earlier let's take this control law 
and basically get it into a numerator denominator format by getting a common denominator. So to avoid me making multiple algebraic errors here, you can see this is a real easy problem. It's just an algebraic manipulation of getting a common denominator here and combining all these things together. So what we can do is at the end of the day is you can show that, all right, if you do all of that, you could write this in the form of um, AKD uh, plus KP S squared plus a k p plus k i s plus a k i all over s s plus a okay so this here is the transfer function whoops sorry c is our transfer function for the controller c let's call this the p i pseudo d right this was the equivalent transfer function representation of this controller. And again, we do the exact same game we did before. You look at this thing long enough and you see, okay, another way to, to describe a PI pseudo D controller is it's nothing more than, again, you still have, what, a second order numerator, so you still got two zeros. So there are two zeros. And again, depending on what those constants are, the roots of that might be complex. So again, let's just write it's potentially complex. And then what else components make up this thing? Well, there's again a pull at the origin. And then there is a real zero at minus a, right? That's this root down here. And again, maybe what we should note here is this real zero minus a came from the uh, break frequency of the pseudo derivative. Right? Because you can see that a term is just right here, and that is, again, the corner frequency or the break frequency of where do we start rolling off the, uh, the noise here? Where does that thing start uh, not acting like a derivative effectively? Okay, so this is great. We see that we're going to do the exact same thing we did earlier is we're going to go over to the control system designer and basically design a root locus by manipulating these things, manipulating the location of the two zeros. We can't manipulate this pull at the origin and we are going to then manipulate this real zero at minus a. So again, maybe what we should do is we should draw the pull zero map of this and we see that, okay, you got the or you got the integrator which you can't manipulate here but you got these two zeros and now you also have this real zero at minus a we should maybe make a quick note of this typically you're going to choose this a value again the a value is the break frequency of where do we want to start filtering out the noise of this system typically that's higher so you want to get rid of high frequency noises so one thing you may want to do is choose this a to be a large enough magnitude so it doesn't influence the dynamics of the rest of your system so what i'm saying is maybe stick this zero further out here right typically like i don't know if the, like maybe minus 100 or something like that so basically you're saying any noise over 100 radians per second is what i want to start uh cutting off so the farther you put this out, the better it is for uh, not interacting with your dynamics as much here. Um, but uh, that also requires faster sampling as well. So there's a little bit of a trade-off. You don't want to put this thing out at minus 8 million here because then you're really not cutting off any noise. You're letting pretty much any, everything through. But if you start pushing it too close here, then you're going to start... Uh, interacting the dynamics of this pseudo derivative are going to start influencing the rest of your root locus which you know it may or may not be a good thing here so I think uh, for our system we're going to use about minus 100 here just for uh, our example but that's not terribly germane to the discussion right now I just wanted to just throw that quick note out here while we're drawing the the pole zero map of the PI pseudo D controller so again the things you get to manipulate here are the position of these two potentially complex zeros and the position of this real zero and the overall gain of the system. So now there are four degrees of freedom for the system, which again makes sense here because there's four degrees of freedom here. You can choose KP, KI, KD, and the A, the break frequency of your system. So what we're going to do is maybe before we leave the whiteboard, let's quickly talk about... 
when we go over to the control system designer, what it's going to get us is it's going to get us, we're going to design this, this second order transfer function, right? So let me just write from the control system designer, we obtain, basically it's going to give you a second order transfer function. Let's just call it C of S. It's going to give you, uh, at the end of the day, you know, like an alpha S squared plus beta S plus gamma all over S, S plus delta, right? Where all of these alpha, beta, gamma, and delta numbers are going to be what values uh, we achieve from the control system designer by moving around all of those zeros and poles and, uh, and gains and things like that. So if you look at this and you look at that, Again, I always like to think, I want to know, I don't care about alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. I care about KP, KI, and KD, because those seem to have some physical intuition and meaning to me. So what I'm getting at here is, you may want to think about solving, this is what you get from Control System Designer, right? We obtained this from MATLAB. I want to now compare this to this and solve for, if someone gives me alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, like MATLAB gives those to me, what are the corresponding uh, KP, KI, and KD, and A values? So you see, it's actually just solving a system of four equations and four nodes at the same time, simultaneously. So you look at this coefficient of S squared. So maybe let's look at the S squared. Right? You see that alpha here had better equal the coefficient of S squared over here. So that better equal A, KD, plus kp right you look at the coefficient of of, uh, of of s right in the numerator and you see okay beta had better equal coefficient of s in the numerator over here that has got equal a kp plus ki then you look at the constant like uh, i guess you want to call it the s zero uh yeah s one zero there something like that so you get gamma has got to equal the constant over here it's got to equal a ki and then you look at this term in the, de the denominator here, and you see that, okay, delta had better equal A, right? So here's the denominator term. So here's equation one, two, three, and four. And basically what you want to do is just solve this for A, KP, KI, and KD. So if you solve those simultaneously, if you go to Mathematica or some other symbolic tool package, you're basically going to see that, okay, um, obviously, well, right off the bat, you see A has got to be delta, right? And then KP is going to be minus gamma uh, plus beta delta uh, all over delta squared. And then your ki is going to be gamma over delta. And kd is going to be, this is kind of ugly, gamma minus beta delta plus alpha delta squared all over delta cubed. Okay? so. Uh, actually, what might be handy now to help you with your workflow is I've actually coded this up already into a MATLAB function. So uh, let me let me erase this to get a little bit more room. So I've boxed all of these equations up for you into a function that I called, uh, what did I call this thing? I called it extract PID gains from second order transfer function. Gosh, that was a ridiculous name. Sorry, and I ran out of room here. Transfer function dot M. Okay, so it's a MATLAB function. It's an M file. And I've got a link to that M file here in the description of this video. So you're free to download this if you want. What you do here is you can pass this thing a transfer function. Right? And as long as this is a second order transfer function of... Oh, crud. I just, I just erased <laughs> the format here. Maybe we should write this down here. You know, uh, uh, alpha S squared plus beta S plus gamma all over... S, S plus delta, right? You give it a transfer function of this form, or you give it a ZPK object of the, you know, of, of the equivalent form. What it will do is it will run these calculations, it'll extract the relevant information, and then spit out for you KP, KI, KD, 
and A, just using these equations here. So the reason I wanted to provide this is because this now makes the workflow a lot easier because where are we gonna get this C of S? We are gonna get this thing from the control system designer. Right? This is what we're going to do is we're going to manipulate the root locus directly in the control system designer and make sure that we meet the performance requirements here. We're going to export the controller from control system designer. It's going to be in this ugly format, which I have no freaking clue what the KP, KI, and KD, and A values are. But then I'm going to pass it to this function that I wrote. Then it will pull out the KP, KI, KD, and A. And then we can go and simulate and implement this on our real system. Right? So. That's the game plan here. Why don't we, uh, let's jump over to MATLAB and, and do this part right here and uh, use our, our function here to get the KPKIKD values. All right, so to design our PI pseudo D controller, all we need to do is let's come back to our control system designer, and here's actually our PI controller that we designed a couple minutes ago. Um, you know what might be interesting? Let's go ahead and store this design. Uh, and now all we need to do is if we want to change this from a PI to a PI pseudo D controller, I'll just come here to the root locus editor, right click, click on edit compensator. And now we see that all we need to do is change this to add the poles and zeros as we just discussed. So I'm going to have to add one real pole. And this pole is going to have to be located at minus 100, right? This was the break frequency of our pseudo derivative. And finally, we need to add one more zero. Uh, although what we could also do, I'll tell you what, let me delete this zero because I don't want two real zeros. I want a complex pair just for fun. You could do either. So let me delete this. And now what I'll do is I will add a complex zero. So now, if you notice, our compensator has the exact form that we had on the board. Namely, it's a second order numerator with a pole at the origin and a pole at minus uh, A or minus 100 in the denominator. So now the game becomes just doing the same thing we did earlier in the sense of just manipulating any magenta items, which are basically controller parameters, to get the closed loop root locus to look the way we want it to. So uh, you can see... You just need to play with this. It's it's a little bit of an iterative process at this point of moving the poles around to locations until you meet all of your design requirements. You can quickly see that as the controller gets more and more complicated, as you have more poles and more zeros, there's going to be a lot more degrees of freedom and it's going to be a lot more difficult to kind of get things to, to, to move the way you want it to because as you move one thing, it's probably going to change something else. So Sooner or later, this is going to be a little bit cumbersome, and we may need to look at difficult, uh, different techniques to design and synthesize more complicated controllers. But for this purpose, it seems to work great. Um, one little trick that maybe I'll leave you with right now is uh, zeros. I like to think of zeros as sort of uh, like they're like magnets, right? We talked about earlier when we were sketching the root locus how as you increase the gain of the of the control system, the loop gain, the open loop poles, uh, sorry, excuse me, the closed loop poles will go to the open loop zero. So zeros literally act as uh, sinks or magnets or places that will suck the root locus towards it. So as you move this around, so for example, if I kind of uh, zoom out a little bit, let me see if I can zoom out and maybe pan over. Th this example may not uh, serve exactly the way I wanted to, but I'm trying to get you to see that as you move this around, you do change the pole. You can kind of see, there we go. This one sort of sucked this pole towards it, and all of the poles will sort of get pulled. Some of the poles will get pulled towards zeros. So this is one little trick that can help you. If you need um, to kind of pull the root locus in certain directions, you may want to think about adding zeros. Of course, to keep your compensator proper, you may need to add poles at the same time. So again, root locus design is a little bit of a, uh, I don't want to say guess and check, but it is definitely iterative. So again, we're just going to keep playing with this until we get a compensator that we like. You can either do this graphically by grabbing and dragging and moving the root locus around, or let me show you another cool feature. You could actually grab and drag other components, like for example here in the um, in the uh, Bode plot editor here, right? So here's my Bode plot for the loop gain to give me gain and phase margin. So you can see right here that I'm not meeting my gain margin at all. So you can also just grab and drag items here in the Bode plot. So let me grab this. Let me just pull this up literally to see if I can get more gain margin. 
And there you go. There we go. So now I grab and drag it, and, well, uh, yeah, I think we wanted 20, 20 decibels. So here we go. This seemed to work. But, again, I guess we, we, have, to, we have to fight this, this battle on multiple fronts. Um, so let's look. Uh, yeah, this is actually looking halfway reasonable. So, again, you can either manipulate the root locus by moving the magenta items. You can manipulate magenta items here in the Bodhi Plot Editor. Or, again, you can just right-click Edit on Compensator and punch in numbers that you would like so for example i would like an overall gain of this and then we know we're not we, we can move this real pole but it won't matter too much but i could also change this complex zero i can make this at minus three point i don't know seven two oh six and an imaginary part of i don't know point eight one five one one i'm just kind of using some numbers right now hit enter hit close and then hey actually look at this that seems to work, right? Look at all of our, look at here, our settling time is good, our overshoot is good, our rise time is good, our gain and phase margins are good, our bandwidth is good, so great, this looks awesome. Tell you what, let's come back here to my control system and I'm going to store this. And again, you can now use the compare if I wanted to look at both design 1 and design 2. You can kind of see how the the two fare against one or the other. So it looks like we actually uh, do a bit of improvement, as is hopefully expected when I add the derivative. We make the controller more comp uh, complicated. Hopefully it's able to do a little bit more. So with that being said, let's go ahead and clear this comparison. And let's go ahead and do like we did earlier. And whoops, let me clear the comparison. And let's export this controller that we've got. And let's call this CPI pseudo d All right and i'll go ahead and export that to the matlab workspace okay so let me see where is this cpi pseudo d here it is and as we said it's this continuous uh, or or kind of odd format we claim this still is a pi pseudo d controller it's just in a polynomial format so what i'm going to do is again supply this function extract Come on, extract, what did I call this thing here? PID gains. So again, go f go to the description of this video. You can download this function, and all you need to do is I'm going to pass it the controller that we just designed in the linear system editor, or uh, sorry, in the control system designer, and it will give me the KP, KI, and KD. So let's just go ahead and try this. Let me copy the function call here and paste it down here. And I need to give this, what did I call this? CPI pseudo D. There we go. And here we are. Here's the gains KP, KI, and KD, and A for that system that we just made. So the last thing we're going to want to do is come to our Simulink model, which was here, I believe. Yep. And let's simulate and verify that that works. So what we're going to have to do is let's augment our system with a pseudo D component as well. So this was KD. And then what we're going to need is a transfer function to represent the, whoops, excuse me. I'm just going to type here and click transfer function. There it is. Okay, and I need this to be my pseudo derivative. Okay, so that thing looked like a coefficient of, let me see, we needed to be a s over s plus a. There we go. So if I hit OK there, I think this is basically, this should act as my pseudo derivative. There it is, AOS over S plus A. Uh, I guess we need a little bit more real estate here with our drawing. Okay, let's put this over here. And, well, I guess I didn't do this quite the best, so I need another plus. Tell you what, to keep this nice, let's switch this to be rectangular. And here we go. So now here's my PI pseudo D controller using the gains that we designed. So let's just go ahead and see now if this system performs the way we expect it to. So I'll just go ahead and hit run. And come here to the scope. And yay, look at that. This controller seems to work great. Um, again, everything looks beautiful here in theory. So the real proof is if I take these gains... KP, KI, KD, and A for my pseudo derivative, and run over to the lab and let's chuck this on the real DC motor to see if this system works. So let's try the full PI pseudo D controller with the same step input, and as I said with the original Nintendo Entertainment System, now you're playing with power.
It would have been a little more impressive if it had just stopped there, but the small amount of error combined with the nasty nonlinear behavior of the friction makes this actually a much more challenging problem. Now, keep in mind that this is not a fully optimized system. We didn't spend an inordinate amount of time tuning the root locus. I bet if we had spent more time, we could have squeezed a bit more performance out of this controller. For example, note that during the majority of the time here, the control signal is actually less than minus 2 volts. However, during the initial step change, the system briefly saturated at minus 15 volts. If we had been willing to tolerate a little bit more controller saturation, I bet we could have made a bit more aggressive controller that would regulate the error more quickly to zero. And these types of changes are actually easy to design for. It simply involves us going back to the root locus in the control system designer and retuning the controller. Now, let's again add that disturbance torque to further illustrate the robustness of the system. And look at this, it seems to work. So in summary, the full PI Pseudo D controller seems to perform even better than the PI system and definitely better than that garbage P only controller. The system is able to meet linear performance requirements as well as handle nonlinear effects such as friction and disturbances. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm very pleased with these results, and it's not just because we got a controller to work, but more because of how we got here. We started by modeling a real plant as a linear system, and then used a mathematically defensible approach to design a controller to meet desired requirements. We spent a lot of time building up to this point, and this is one of the first examples where we've been able to see the full control design cycle yield a successful outcome with a real system. All right, so we've seen how we can use the root locus technique to design a PIE, pseudo D, PID, PI, any type of controller. So why don't we talk about generalizing this? So now it's no longer just how to design a PID controller, but how about how to design a linear controller using the root locus technique. So again, the concept is pretty simple. Instead of using a specific root lo or a specific PID structure, this controller can be anything of the form some gain, let's call it K, with an S plus Z1, S plus Z2, all the way S plus ZM, right? It's just M zeros, all over an S plus P1, S plus P2, all the way S plus PN. So, you got M zeros, N poles, so this doesn't have to be a PI controller, this is really any linear controller. And the process of designing intelligently this gain K, these Z's, and these P's are exactly what we just talked about. So, the procedure is really straightforward. So one, step one is basically, you know, get a model of your plant. And then go ahead and like we talked about earlier, just import that in your control system designer or whatever tool you like for visualizing the root locus as well as visualizing step responses and body plots and anything else you need to know to understand the behavior of the system. And then all you're gonna do here is manipulate by adding, uh, manipulate the root locus by adding poles and zeros which correspond to this controller, right? So step two is really manipulate the root locus by adding appropriate poles slash zeros corresponding to your controller. And you know what, it's, it, it's almost that simple. There's almost like two steps. Sure, there's all these bells and whistles of exporting the, the, the controller, extracting gains if you want it in a different structure and all that stuff, but at its heart, this is all it is. is all you're doing is you're making a controller by appropriately placing poles and zeros so that you can manipulate the root locus of the closed loop system. Because really, at the end of the day, that's a lot of what linear classical control theory is, right? It's just placing the poles of the system, of the closed loop system, in locations where you, where you want them to go. So, um, with that being said, I, I hope you enjoyed the discussion today and you can see why this is so powerful and why it's, it's applicable to pretty much any linear controller of this structure. 
So, um, if you've been a subscriber to the channel for a while, thanks for being with us. If not, please subscribe because we're going to be having lots of other videos on control systems engineering in the future. Uh, I'm trying to organize all of this curriculum because you've seen I have a lot of different other videos related to systems and topics like this. So, check out the description of this video for a link to a more comprehensive uh, summary of all the videos as well as sort of a curriculum slash syllabus. So, with that being said, I think this is maybe a good spot to wrap it up, and I hope to catch you at one of these future videos. So until then, I'll talk to you later. Bye.